In this video, we're going to look at beta cell function, dysfunction, and beta cell failure and stuff like that in terms of the pancreas. So let's get on with it. So I'll just share my screen. This is going to be a bit involved, but I'm going to try and keep it as, let's say, as less sciencey as possible. Okay. So screens. So I'll try and get through this fast. Anyway, um, this is a study that actually looked at uh, insulin secretion, insulin sensitivity, and beta cell function. This was a randomized control um, uh, placebo controlled trial, diabetes 2 and vitamin D deficiency. I'm not even going to look at it because there's a lot to cover in this video. So this was a trial Australasia New Zealand. They said basically um, vitamin D and calcium supplementation for six months may not change OGTT derived measures of insulin sensitivity, insulin secretion or better cell function in multi-ethnic adults with low vitamin D status at risk of vitamin of type two diabetes. However, in participants with pre-diabetes, supplementation with vitamin D and calcium may improve insulin sensitivity. That's all it does. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff. And that, and that probably wor is working on a number of things, sort of improving the, the function. And I would say that it's less the, the calcium and I would say more the vitamin D in terms of the autoimmune aspect of the condition. And, uh, you know, so that's where I'm thinking it's actually playing a big role rather than anything else. So just keep that in mind. I just wanted to cover this point because a lot of people will talk about the importance of uh, low carbohydrate diets plus vitamin D. I think there's more involved in this, in this story than just that. And I think it has to do a lot with the derangements and the way the pancreas functions. So let's get into it. Anyway. Mechanisms of beta cell failure, glucotoxicity. Yes, yes. Glucose concentrations are a major determinant for regulation of B cell mass and function, as this, the, um, uh, discussed above. Transient increases in glucose levels within physiological range induce insulin secretion and potential beneficial signals. Um, you know, when your insulin to glucagon is at that, at that lower gradient and all that. You're not going to get really much issues. Things can be properly regulated and all that, you know, um, in those more normal ranges when we get into excessive levels, like in our current culture of hyper palatable foods and hyper, um, uh, you know, consumption of carbohydrates and refined carbohydrates. We are getting into these really deranged states of glucotoxicity, hypo glucose intake okay in the in contrast glucotoxicity induced by prolonged hypoglycemia and you can only get prolonged hypoglycemia if you're on a very high carbohydrate diet for a very long long length of time and you basically batter and batter and continually strike and hit at those beta cells, it can only take so much. You know, when you basically overuse something, it's like over revving something continuously. Well, there's going to be more damage to it. And their nutrition tends to be piss poor, especially the Bagoonerized community. So, yes, um, no wonder, you know, Durian Rider and people like that, he's losing his hair and all sorts of things. You know, wait until he gets into my age, middle age, and, you know, he'll really be falling apart big time causes B cell dysfunction and alters B cell mass. Anyway, beta cell failure in diabetes and, um, and preservation by clinical treatment. So this is basically the endocrine society. This is basically a um, piece of older research. Um, and they are actually looking at how can they actually prevent this beta cell failure. This is with medications, obviously. So it's all basically to stitch it all together because there's no one study that actually tells you 
this is what's causing it. This is what cures it. We can, you know, basically, I'm trying to stitch it all together for you guys without making it too complicated and too difficult to understand. Anyway, another intervention is the induction of beta cell arrest by selective activation of ATP sensitive calcium channels. Oh, sorry, potassium channels, K plus potassium. Using drugs such as diozoxic, diozoxid. So that's a, a drug that basically can improve the functioning of the, the potassium channels, okay? Because basically the calcium ones are the ones which are the issue. So let's move on. So this is basically decreased beta cell mass in diabetes, significant mechanisms and therapeutic implications. So this is a Swiss University of Zurich. And you can actually see innate immunity. We know the immunity is involved, T, T cell lymphocytes. T cell lymphocytes think two things, vitamin D and taurine, okay? So we know it's, a, it's associated, but they don't understand the mechanisms. Um, autoimmunity, think vitamin D and taurine to a, a certain secondary role and some of the other fat soluble vitamins as a secondary role. They think there are probably some viruses and they're probably maybe, but remember again, poor immune system, more susceptible to viruses as well. Sun, salt and meat will basically be your best option. Therapies, uh, I'll give big farm or a miss. On that one, obviously, you know, for the adipocytes, fat cells, TNF, um, uh, tumor necrosis factor A, interleukin-6 and leptin signaling issues. Now, we know that basically, because I've shown you before on tumor necrosis factor, what's our favorite supplement that deals with that one? Uh, taurine. Yes, good, 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 um, uh, boys and girls. Anyway. So we've basically got the glucose part, and then there's the fats, LDL, VLDL. They don't have IDL there, but anyway, goes back to the adipose tissue or to the islets of the beta cell. So that's just to give you a general description of that. Now we need to go here. Uh, yes, okay, the two mechanisms. So is there a common pathway linked, linking reduced beta cell mass and impaired beta cell function? We need to find out the, the actual pathways. Two mechanisms possibly account for such impaired beta cell function, consequ um, consequently to decreased beta cell mass. So obviously when you've got dysfunction, you're gonna have basically a reduction in the mass of the beta cells that's a problem because then you're driven towards very poor outcomes. And potentially some people can um, end up from diabetes two to becoming diabetes one, where they've lost pancreatic function. Um, obviously, if you're in a mum that's actually eating a lot of shit, you could end up with the type one in, in the womb. Anyway, let's move on. So, one, increased insulin demand on residual beta cells per se leads to changes in function, whereas by ER endoplasmic reticulum, um, stress or other mechanisms. So that's within the, within the actual cell. I remember around the nucleus, you've got all those, that whole area that's around it, well, that's the ER. Okay, so when I say ER, that's what I mean, okay? Stressing, when you stress that, what you're actually talking about is um, affecting the folding of proteins. Got it? And remember our favorite supplement that basically helps with protein folding? Ah, oh, yes, taurine again to the rescue. Anyway, so 
This is why I'm actually showing you, explaining you these mechanisms. This is, these are the things that a lot of research, mechanistic researchers come up with, where they're actually seeing that there is dysfunction in these areas. What's happened to our diet? We are, we've got a very poor consumption of meat. So our meat and seafood consumption has dramatically declined in the last couple of decades, in the last 40 years in particular. And that basically has meant less taurine and less regulation of these things, plus um, that, you know, issues with protein folding, issues with basically um, the toxicity within these mechanisms. Now, let's go. Hyperglycemia consequences to decrease beta cell mass drives the impairment of beta cell function. Okay. Distinguishing between the two is complicated by the fact that decreasing beta cell mass ex experimentally more often than not leads to a more or less prolonged period of hypoglycemia. So what they're trying to say here is, as one goes down, it'll actually create a bigger, it'll magnify the effect of hyperglycemia. So is that hyperglycemia is a reduction in mass. You know what I mean? The chicken and the egg thing. This is why, um, you need to do very long-term studies, which we haven't done, because then you'd be able to make these measurements with biopsies and all that. You can't lock people up, which is unfortunate, but that's the reality. And we don't want to live in a world where we do lock people up because, well, oh, we already do, don't we? Oh yeah, that's right. That's for the, the current uh, pa pandemic. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, yes. You know, I can't miss a, an opportunity to say, make a comment. Anyway, let's move on from there to the role. And okay, so what we need to understand is how these things are working. The role of membrane excitability in pancreatic beta cell glucotoxicity. Okay, so. Here, we basically identified glucose toxicity as one factor, and the other one, the ER stress mechanism. That means that dysfunction and signaling, because here you've basically got, in terms of these signaling pathways that are causing problems, okay? Now, persistent hyperglycemia is causally associated with it's associated, it's, you know, with pancreatic, um, uh, mechanistically that is, with pancreatic beta cell dysfunction and loss of pancreatic um, insulin. Glucose normally enha um, enhances beta cell excitability through inhibition of calcium channels. So when glucose comes in, what it does is, um, it basically, there you get an inhibition. These are through signaling um, molecules, an inhibition of the, um, the calcium channels, opening a voltage dependent, sorry, of the potassium channels, opening a voltage dependent calcium channel increases calcium, which triggers insulin secretion. Okay, so calcium comes in, you get this. But obviously, if you have this permanent derangement of calcium channels, hmm, I wonder what regulates calcium potassium channels. Hmm. Oh, our favorite supplement, taurine. Is chronically elevated and insulin is constantly secreted. Now, we don't want constant secretion, you know, like the vagoons, like jewelry and rider you know, carb loading continuously and continuously. What happens? Damage to the pancreas. That's happen what happens to Tim Noakes. Remember, Tim Noakes was doing for years and years and years as an athlete and coach. He was doing carb loading, low fat diets with a lot of carbohydrates and stuff like that for marathons and stuff like that. What do you do? He damaged his pancreas. Voila, based on this sort of stuff, he was the human example. This is in a, a mouse model. Yes, if you overload it, you're going to get the same effect. 
So here they've basically mutated a certain mouse and all that and to, to be able to play around with this sort of stuff. So even if you've, you've got low, I'll show you the quickly. So type two diabetes, normal, um, calcium ATP channels, glucose up, metabolism up, excitatory effects up. So, and calcium up, insulin secretion up, better cell damage. Obviously, you know, if uh, you can actually knock out that sort of thing, you're gonna have a reduction in these, but that's in a, in a, in a mouse model, which they're playing around with these things to see exactly what happens when these things go down or go up or whatever. So that doesn't interest us. Um, that's not the purpose of why I actually showed you this. The purpose of this is to basically understand that basically this excitability factor is the big thing with calcium. Okay, regulation of calcium in pan pancreatic alpha and beta cells in healthy, in health and disease. The alpha ones are glucagon, the beta ones are insulin, just for those people. Okay. Glucoregulatory hormones, insulin and glucagon are released from beta and alpha cells of pancreatic islets. In both cell types, secretion of secondary to firing of action potential calcium influx as it comes in via voltage gate channel. Elevation of calcium, initiation of calcium dependent, exo cytosis. That's actually a mechanism of actually transporting molecules in um, and out of the actual cells, which is basically proteins and, and lipids, stuff like that and other things. So it's a enzymatic pathway anyway. Um, here we discuss the mechanism that underlies regulation of insulin and glucagon secretion by changes in plasma glucose. The role displays a different type of voltage gate calcium channel present in A and B cells and modulation of hormone secretion of calcium dependent independent processes. We also consider how subtle changes in calcium signaling, okay, may have profound impact on beta cell performance and increased risk of developing type two diabetes. Got it? Very important. So excess glucose is going to basically really push these levels of calcium flooding into the actual, the, these cells. Now, we get the same thing in the, in the brain, remember? We get the same thing happening in the brain and what's actually, what actually um, decreases that? Again, taurine, it regulates. And this is another reason why high doses of taurine can actually norm, in, in somebody with diabetes can actually sort of normalize, um, you know, if they're not excessively taking in, it can sort of normalize um, blood sugar levels to a degree. Again, because it's affecting the calcium channels, that's why. And I think in the past when people did consume one third, two thirds animal foods, getting more, um, uh, you know, in through their diet, getting more taurine, that one third of sugar, yes, they did work hard physically, but on the other, on the other hand as well, the taurine would have had a reducing effect on the, the severity of glucose toxicity potential. Quicker clearance and better beta, func beta cell function. I think that's the thing that we've lost with the highly processed foods and eliminating a lot of the animal foods. Because when you process even the animal foods, the one third that now it is, it's all processed. If you take a look, milk, pasteurized and burnt to the, to the you know, very high temperatures, you lose all taurine, forget it. Um, all the other um, packaged foods and all that, they've got meat, uh, some meat in it, but it's all highly processed. You've lost all the taurine as well. 
basically you you're eliminating a key component where in the past we consumed a lot of seafood and even societies like japan and all that they have a lot of raw meats raw um, seafood and a lot of things like that traditional societies still do that and that's where they get their extra taurine to regulate and even in those lower levels remember i showed you that other study or even in lower sort of levels of taurine um, if somebody's healthy it can do pretty good regulation we only have to go to very high levels with for therapeutic purposes when we've got derangements we need to correct so but this is important that you guys understand the importance of you know this regulation um, of these calcium channels. Okay, they're all on voltage gate calcium channels in better cell um, physiology and, patho and pathophysiology. Okay, now point. Put me. Uh, no. Better cell calcium channels are regulated by a wide range of mechanisms. Either, well, I'll tell you what it is. A good steak will do that with a, with a, with um, a nice bit of taurine in it. Mm. Either shared or by other cell types or specific beta cells to always guarantee a satisfactory concentration of calcium. Inappropriate regulation of beta cell calcium channels. Got it? Inappropriate. This is what the literature is showing constantly in all these animal models when they do these mechanistic tests. That's what they show. Obviously, they're not testing foods, but we know the food that regulates, don't we, boys and girls? Causes beta cell dysfunction and even death manifested in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So in those sort of cases, we know that both type 1 and type 2, we see the death of beta cells. And basically these derangements in calcium channels is what is causing this death. Mm. But the food recommendations back in the 1970s have something to do potentially with this change in the osmolite that isn't in our diet much anymore? Hmm. I wonder. I'm convinced that it is, but uh, you know, obviously you can't experiment on humans <laughs> and do that test because <laughs> you know you'd have. But uh, let's say we understand all these mechanisms and we know what regulates it and we know what we took out of the diet a couple of decades ago. You know, I think there's a good, you, could, you, um, you know, you can string a few things together. And that's what I'm doing with this video, string things together to show this relationship. Anyway, taurine regulates insulin release from pancreas beta cell lines. Say no more. Pancreatic beta cell release insulin via electrogenic response triggers in by an increase in plasma glucose concentrations. We've talked about those, um, uh, the calcium channels um, in that regard. The critical plasma glucose concentration has been determined to be three millimoles at which time both insulin and GABA are released from pancreatic beta cells. Taurine, uh, B sulfonic acid, may be transported into cells to balance osmotic pressure. Remember what I said, this goes way back in evolution. Taurine has been there from the beginning in eukaryotic cell lines to basically guarantee this osmolotic pressure. Remember, if you put too much in the, you know, endoplasmic reticulum, which is the ER, that middle part, if 
you put too much, there's too much pre, um, you know, pressure in the cell. So it causes misfolding. You know, if you actually push up glycolytic pathways, remember with, as I said, with COVID that actually pushes up the glycolytic pathways, it causes misfolding. And remember, the dysfunction and damage of beta cells is due to protein misfolding. You know, so what's actually regulating and preventing folding mis, um, protein misfolding? Taurine. It's the same thing with, you know, beta amyloid in the brain, you know, clearing up the glycating effects and all that and, pre and preventing the misfolding of beta amyloid so it's cleared properly. Again, it's there, it's everywhere. It's basically been there for millions and millions and millions and millions of years. That's how important it is. Taurine tra transporter has been described in pancreatic tissues, but the function of taurine in insulin release has not been established. Uptake of taurine by pancreatic beta cells may alter membrane potential and have an effect on iron currents. This is the regulation within the actual, these cells of calcium, potassium. That's what it's doing. That's what its purpose is as an osmolite. And that will control the excitability and also the pressure. So too much pressure can cause damage. Too many of the organelles and many of the components inside, not a good thing. If taurine uptake does alter beta cell current, it might have an effect on the exo, exocytosis of a cytoplasmic um, the vesicle. So that's the actual that transport mechanism that I talked about before. And uh, you know, within the cytoplasm, there's all these little organelles and stuff like that, do a lot of different functions and stuff like that. We wish to test the effect of taurine on regulating release of insulin from pancreatic beta cells. Method, oops, stop. Method B, pancreatic beta cell line, it T1, TL5, serine hamster, and uh, Rin M, rat insula, insula, the NOMA were used in these studies. Obviously, we can't experiment on humans. Cells were grown to about 80% on confused un, on uncoated cover glass in RMI medium containing 100% fecal horse serum. These cells were then adapted to a serum free, glucose free environment for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. At that time, the cells were treated with either one millimole of glucose, one millimole of taurine, one millimole of glucose plus one millimole of taurine, um, three millimoles of glucose plus three millimoles of glucose plus one millimole of taurine. Cells were examined by professional microscopy for cytoplasmic levels of insulin in both cell lines. The one had no effect on insulin levels and served as a control, obviously, at that, that's the basic level for insulin secretion. Cells starved of glucose had a significant reduction and that's a high P value, yes. So basically that's obvious in the levels of insulin. So low carbohydrate diets, gonna have low insulin, but this level was significantly higher than all other treatments. As expected, um, three millimoles of glucose treatment resulted in a statistically lower insulin level than the control cells. Interestingly, the one millimole also resulted in statistically lower levels of insulin compared to the control when either no glucose or just one millimole of glucose were present. Cells treated with one millimole of taurine plus three millimoles of glucose showed a level of insulin similar to that of three millimole of glucose alone. So basically we saw same. Taurine administration can alter the electrogenic response. And that's basically, you know, you're talking about the effects 
um, of the the gates you know, of your calcium and and, the, and basically potassium channels. So in terms of controlling response in beta cell lines, leading to a change in calcium homeostasis, really important in controlling calcium within the proper range of proper function. As a consequence, decreases in intracellular insulin levels. The consequence of these actions could present a method of increasing plasma insulin levels leading to a decrease in plasma glucose levels. So getting proper function, but while maintaining proper homeostasis within the actual beta cells and not causing this hypotoxicity or this hypo excitability, which does damage and dysfunction in that regard. So people can actually go away, take a look at the, take a look at the, at, you know, the sort of results. There's a whole lot of uh, stuff. I'm not gonna go through it now because it's gonna take ages otherwise. You can actually see the different in terms of insulin levels. Go through there in terms of the calcium channels and their effect. This proposed scheme by which taurine may affect insulin and GABA release from pancreatic beta cells. So this is a mechanism that they, I'll just cover this. Transport of taurine to pancreatic beta cells may be sufficient to cause the release of insulin. We believe that mechanisms by which this can occur in beta cells involves interaction between taurine, ADP sensitive calcium channels, in these cells in vivo, the rise of intracellular glucose levels results in condolence increase in cytoplasmic ATP, ADPH, ADP, um, PH, all required for insulin um, transport. In part of mechanism, of this action requires to increase ATP to ADP ratio, which closes ATP dependent potassium channels closure of um, uh, potassium channels, depolarization of beta cells and activates voltage gates for calcium channels. The resulting increase in this transport is responsible for part of the excitosis of the insulin containing large dense core vesicles. And Torin has been shown to inhibit in skeletal muscle fibers, in these fibers, Tore binds. So, and we want in skeletal muscles to take up that, you know, we want that effect of the calcium channels. We want basically that to get the glucose in there. If taurine is administered chronically, the metabolic um, relevance could manifest as chronic hypoglycemia. Obviously, I wouldn't actually show this. This isn't really an issue if you're on a low carbohydrate diet. But if you're on a high carbohydrate diet and you take excess levels of taurine or you're engaging the Randall cycle, yes, because you are lowering, you will lower your efficiently, your blood sugar levels. But if you can't access fat because you're not fat adapted, that could be an issue. Got it? Could be an issue in high doses. But if you're fat adapted, less likely. Even in people that are not deranged, I, I did, you know, I always like to show things that are a bit out of the box. Now that's their, their argument. I think it's only when you say somebody who's insulin resistant, somebody which is deranged or has these issues where you're going to be pulling out um, out of the system more 
you know, you know, reducing the um, this glucose toxicity in the body, but it's really an issue for people who are not fat adapted. It's really for people that are, you know, insulin resistant, have a lot of, you know, engaging the Randall cycle and all that. This could be an issue with those people. This is why those sort of people, I tend to not recommend high doses of taurine. I stick them to about two grams or four grams at most, which actually makes them more insulin sensitive. Even though they're eating kibble, you know, it's like vegans. I recommend that they take four grams, no more, you know? So again, but if somebody's on a low carbohydrate diet, they can go to these higher levels where they can get those therapeutic effects that we talk about. Where at the two to four, you're going to get some, but not a lot. So that's the little issue, the proviso. Um, you know, it's, I think that should be a, quite clear to people that if you want to do therapeutic levels of taurine, you've got to be in a low carbohydrate state in that regard. But I've had people who are on a mixed diet who have been on six grams and have had no problems whatsoever. So while they have to put that out there as a warning thing, I don't think we've got enough, you know, enough basically evidence to say exactly where that limit is in terms of taurine um, for people on a mixed diet. Um, I think it's, I haven't put anyone above six on a mixed diet for the simple fact that I don't want to take the risk in it than anything else. Um, and you shouldn't experiment on your parents or people like that, especially if they're on a kibble diet or that. Um, that's why I usually have said four grams to um, uh, six grams of leucine, try and get more the benefits of muscle protein synthesis and stuff like that. Um, but when it comes to basically uh, regulating the, panc the um, pancreas and all that, or if there's a mother who's got a child who's basically, um, you know, with being diagnosed with diabetes one or you know the early stages i would seriously if it was my child and it was in that state i would seriously put it on the low carbohydrate diet and maximize its taurine levels um obviously for a child a small child you don't have to go up to 10 grams or whatever um you know probably about four grams would be equivalent to an adult of 10 or pl 10 plus um, that sort of levels, which would be probably good enough. Um, you could go to excessive levels for the child up to six. Um, I probably would if it was my child, um, but I can't recommend it for anyone. I can recommend four for a child, but I can't recommend above that. Um, if, yeah, as long as a child is on a low carbohydrate diet and disciplined, you'll see beneficial results because the ultimate thing is you know at that age you can control what they eat you know once they become an adult it's really hard to control so you really have to go hard and strong at that early age fix the problem um, restore better cell function restore regulation lower the inflammation and damage and dysfunction you know the endoplasmic reticulum within those cell lines need to be basically um, properly functioning and folding protein and pro folding pro pro protein folding needs to be working properly within those ribosomes within between those folds of the endoplasmic reticulum because otherwise you know if there is high er stress you're basically going to get more derangements more damage and and over time, um, more and more loss of beta cell function and death of beta cells. 
And once you lose too much, I don't know where the threshold is. We've never, because you can't experiment on humans, obviously. So we don't really know where the threshold is. Um, we have noticed that some people who have started their children on a low carbohydrate diet have seen restoration and some even massive improvements. It, but it varies so much. And I suspect that varies because the amount of, you know, hot, you know, some parents may be cooking their meats too much and losing a lot of the taurine and are unaware of what the magic component that's actually helping is. That it's not the meat per se, it's the stuff inside the meat, inside the seafood, which is called taurine, which is doing this magical osmotic osmolotic regulation of all these systems in the body including in the pancreas and i think that's really the message here that in order to improve you know, regulation of beta of um, your pancreas in general beta and alpha cells you really need to get good levels of taurine in the system and you need to basically reduce the glucose content in your diet pretty much to you know, you don't require the requirement for glucose is zero, absolutely zero. You know, um, your body can synthesize as much glucose on demand that whatever tissue in your body requires, you know, like your certain brain cells, um, your red blood cells, and you know, a bit is required um, within your reproductive system in terms of um, glo glo glycosylation of proteins um, or, you know, where you see the little glycans, those little sugary glycans on the surface of cells that provide signaling. Um, obviously that, that there is a certain level of sugar. The, in your endothelium, you've got the glyco glycocalyx, those little hairline structures and all that they need little sugar molecules on top as well to be glycosylated to have some glucose and that actually then can actually attach sulfurs to that and that sulfur can then create a negative charge increasing nitric oxide synthesis plus it can be enhanced with grounding as well um, so and that also has to do with all the actual you know whether it's your ldl or hdl or all that all these little transport vessels, they have a pericellular matrix as well. You know, this is the sort of stuff we need to do. We need to go back to ancestral sort of eating and approaches. And these things, these dysfunctions go away or improve or reverse. Um, the earlier you get into it, the earlier you start fixing this problem. And this is why I tend to basically try to shift people on that are, have diabetes too, I try and shift them quicker to a carnival diet. Initially, I start with getting them on a sort of like a paleo-esque diet, then shifting them um, to lowering and lowering the carbohydrate content until I get them into a low carbohydrate state. Then from there, get them into a carnival state eventually um, while upping their taurine as I'm going along to basically... Um, improve all these different areas of function in the body. Um, usually I would say once people have got quite a bit of damage, I would say you'd have to be on pretty high doses of taurine, um, anywhere between six and 10, if not more, if you're an adult, that is, for a couple of years to really restore um, the pancreatic function again. So proper um, this is my personal belief that it, um, this is a requirement if you're going to get the best results. Um, you need to regulate your body and taurine is a master regulator. It's been with us for millions and millions of years inside eukaryotic cell lines and those cell lines that have evolved all the way to us basically have had this substance inside them to function properly to control the actual pressure of the actual cell plus the regulation of the cell and 
the fluids and the ions. And in this case, we're um, for the beta cells, we're talking about the calcium and potassium um, channels and those ions. But uh, pretty much that's it, guys. It's more or less to give you to sort of stitch all this together. Um, and this is how I sort of look at all these studies and I sort of stitch it all together and go, okay, huh, okay, this is affecting this, this is affecting that. That's stopping excitatory effect. That's regulating this part. That's regulating that part. Okay, this has an effect on that pathway, that part. Okay, so this is a substance we need to have in our diet to basically regulate these components, these mechanisms or systems or enzymes or whatever in the body. And that's how you basically have to see it. So, because I didn't have, you know, one of those, because sometimes I, I, I do find one of those really good mechanistic studies where I can just give you the one study and go, this is it. Here's an example and all that. Unfortunately, in, in, this, in this area of beta, of pancreatic dysfunction and beta, beta cell function and dysfunction, there is not really. I mean, if there was some mechanism, um, mecha, proper mechanistic um mechanistic study you know like a true experiment and all that what we would have is odd you know it would get around but nobody's done the actual experiment they haven't put taken people with you know damaged pancreases and put them on high doses of taurine to see what happens nobody's done the experiment yet so that's why you have to go sort of around it, you know, to say, okay, these are all the things that we know that have been proven mechanistically to cause the dysfunction of the pancreas. Now, what is regulating these things? Voila, taurine, you know. So that's how we've got around this. But I would love to see at some stage somebody doing an experiment um, with people with diabetes um, one and diabetes two, which have progressed. And there's quite a bit of damage put them on a low carb diet and then put them on a high dose of taurine and have a control group and see how they progress the two groups um over a decade it would be great to see um, a, a bit of research of that sort unlikely it's going to happen because you know most of the organizations out there are not interested um they do a lot of this mickey mouse stuff for tenure unfortunately well, maybe this will inspire somebody who's a subscriber and has a, you know, wants to get into science. Well, maybe they'll try and crowdfund something to basically try and do one of these experiments. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. See you.